Should I go ahead? Hi everyone. Um, it seems that quite a few of you are fairly coherent I crew already, so I'm well along before you start, otherwise it may have been a bit of pressure to live up to. Um, I rather hastily put this slide out together yesterday. I, I arrived and uh, discovered my travel card didn't work, so I was uh, racing against the clock before my before my laptop shut down yesterday evening um, and was unable to find a, a replacement in the hotel or, or any of the shops on site on site for each day. Um, so really I'll, I'll go through what my tree is, um, its applications. Um, I got some slides in there on planning up the eco project and, and the marketing communication and engagement and then um, case studies and, and you the results. It may be that a lot of you are already familiar with these uh, processes anyway, but hopefully it will be informative to some of you. Um, so iTree is a um, peer-reviewed US open software um, suite of packages. Um, primarily talked about iTree Eco and iTree Canopy. Um, there's a number of other packages, landscape planting, design, iTree species. Some are set up for, for certainly the UK, but I believe across Europe as well. Others are, are only really formatted for the US at the moment. Um, so who uses it? This is a, a rather old slide now frame. I'm sure there are probably far more dots within, within Europe um, than there were at this point in 2014. Predominantly, as you can see, it's been used across the USA, um, being used quite extensively in the UK uh, by us and, and other organisations. And then dots around Europe and, and some in Australia as well. Um, so iTree Canopy, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with it. Again, it's another method of assessing canopy cover. Um, it's a point-based survey using satellite imagery. So effectively clicking on a point, is it a tree, is it not a tree? Um, the more points you have within an area, the more accurate that, that canopy cover calculation will be. Um, although it's just a point-based system, so it's obviously less, less accurate than IR photography. Um, analyzing with, with machine learning like you have uh, complete satellite imagery. Um, and we can use that so that with ONS data that's in the UK, that's uh, Office of National Statistics. Um, so I'm sure, I don't, I don't know where in Europe you are with tree equity. Um, in the US, quite a lot of people have been made with tree equity and it's certainly a growing area in the UK as well. I'm guessing probably across Europe that, that's also true. Um, so the data that we would use with the Office of National Statistics would be indexes of multiple deprivations, so effectively indexes of poverty or poor quality of life. Um, and then we can combine that with heat island effects, localised flooding, air pollution data. Um, and generally every area I've looked at, when that is overlaid with tree canopy cover, um, you'll find that those areas with the lowest tree canopy cover certainly have the highest heat, high, heat island effects highest levels of, of deprivation in the, in the public, so low earnings, low health outcomes, poorer achievement in schools, high crime rates, high levels of localised flooding. Um, obviously that's skewed in some way by the, the wealthier areas having larger gardens, larger, larger properties, wider streets, so there's more tree canopy be covered within gardens and within, within, within street trees. Um, but certainly when you look at areas where the tree kind of cover is higher, but there's you know, less social differences, you're still obviously seeing the high levels of um, the island effects, localised flooding, and also poorer health, health outcomes in those areas where the <coughs> tree kind of cover is lower. Um, the Woodland Trust in the UK are actually setting up a tree equity map. Um, I don't know if, it, if, you, if you have any of them anywhere in Europe, um, and effectively you can topple the parameters that you want to set for, for the importance of increasing tree canopy cover. So they'll calculate the tree canopy cover for an area. Um, and then if you're looking at you know, poor educational outcomes, poor health outcomes, higher levels of elderly people in the population, then you can really focus your tree planting efforts on those areas for whatever particular um, issue you're looking to alleviate with, with tree planting. And also, you know, remove areas from, from tree planting if, if you know, it's not going to be the most benefit to, to the population for planting trees in those areas. Um, so, how does I tree eco work? And hopefully, I'm not, uh, some of you may, may not be completely familiar. 
Uh, effectively, it starts off with, with uh, collecting field data. You can either input tree inventory data that's already been recorded across the city, um, and there's, there's sort of minimum requirements for data input in with an iTree, and you can build that up to get more accurate results. But effectively, what you really need, the most, you certainly need uh, diameter of breast heights and species, um, then really you want crown heights, completeness of crown, so you can work out the leaf area index. Um, but for a sort of simplified ivory study, you could be as little as uh, species and, and diameter of breast heights. Um, so from that, you can work out the structure of your urban forest. You'll, you'll uh, if it's a complete inventory, you know exactly what you've got. Um, carrying out a sample survey, you're extrapolating up from, from plots across an area um, that you'll get to a, a good standard error. Um, number of trees, species composition, dimensions, health, the leaf area and the biomass. Um, and from that we can calculate the ecosystem services that, that are um, provided. So carbon storage and sequestration, air pollution removal, stormwater attenuation, buildings and energy use, UV filtration and urban forest food, which is probably less of a useful metric really. Um, really just lets you know that sort of what the trees produce, but, but that's not something we've, we've used very much, and I'm sure it's a, a great piece of information future. From that, and forgive me, everything's in, uh, in pound size, I guess it should be in, uh, in at least euros, but you've got the pound size, you can get the annual benefits, and we can work out the replacement costs um, on CTLA costs, which is the US methodology, or in the UK, we have a system called CAVA, which is the capital asset valuation of the meter to trees. Um, so that's a, a system which is effectively working out the immediacy value trees provide. Um, hopefully that's not sure about the, the language barrier, hopefully that <laughs> the immediacy value are just, just the benefit the trees are giving to members of the public by simply being there um, and, and the appreciation of those trees. Um, so key concepts underpinning the use of iTree. Um, making the most of trees requires a strategic approach to tree population management, um, green asset valuation, and it seems that your system there is, is able to quantify some benefits that we're not within iTree, like the actual overall cooling. Um, we can't calculate the biodiversity benefits of trees, although we can look at dependent species on the tree stock once they're established. You know, we, there's no way of actually assessing the biodiversity benefits trees are, are giving through through white tree and likewise the community value but we can use the data we put into the white tree to, to work out the US method how that, um, sorry the UK method there's no no price given to the immunity value and also to those health savings um, that trees you know trees provide um, where there, there are methods of doing that again the office of national statistics in the UK calculated um, or, or um, a figure on the um, reduction in health costs tree, trees provide that's largely come from surveying um, members of the public who have spent time in nature and around trees and then assessing their overall health and sort of the, you know working out from that the, the savings to, to the health services um, and then in chain better data can if used well promote better understanding um, which in turn can lead to change. And one thing we've really found with, with the iTree studies that we carry out is, you know, we can give people the data in the world. Some organizations, you know, very little happens that sits on people's desks and, and the, the overall benefits of carrying out that study are limited. But, you know, if, if the audience is tree officers, tree managers, they're aware of the benefits that trees provide, it's getting that information out to policy holders um, and the wider public to, to help them appreciate the values that trees are providing and then um, you know, really encourage them to, to take an active role in caring for their trees and promoting more planting and, and uh, freeing up budgets hopefully for tree management and tree planting. Although I should, should say, I guess it's similar across, across Europe at the moment. There's no end of money for planting trees, but actually establishing them and then caring for the trees we've got is uh, a very different situation than we have. Uh, Politicians probably in every authority area as well as at national scale who are keen to 
plant 100,000 trees, a million trees, two million trees, with, with no idea of where the trees are going or, or any sort of long-term budget for their management quite often, um, which is, you know, where pipe trees, one of those factors comes in very handy for being able to partly target planting in the right areas, but also look at resistance to diseases, um, improving species diversity and therefore improving the, the resilience of the urban forests. Um, so, I kind of get a lot of this, I'm sorry, it's probably likely to be you know, very well known to all of you, but it's a, a rather <laughs> race against the clock before my battery ran up yesterday to diversify the show together for you. Um, so, I do really focus on the uh, benefits of delivery. Um, and we're looking at whole populations, as I'm sure you all know, as urban foresters rather than, than single trees. Um, And it's saying that you know, recognizing the, the benefits of the whole tree population is, is fundamentally important. So getting those messages out to those people beyond tree management. So whether that be highways and infrastructures managers who often you know see trees as a liability rather than an asset in any way, um, planning and development control, control of the state owners, managers, communities, um, case studies. So. We have carried out ITRE UK projects for a number of organisations across the UK, from local authorities, business improvement districts, large asset owning public agencies, and community groups. Um, the first study we carried out was Tor Bay there in 2011, um, and we just rerun that study uh, in 2021. Um, interestingly, largely due to the effects of ash dieback and a couple of other sort of plant health issues with uh, Phytophthora reborum, there was some, some sanitation failing in some woodland. Um, but the number of trees has fallen by around 200,000 trees in that 10 years. But the tree canopy has actually increased um, from 12% up to, to 18%, I believe. Um, that's through a number of factors, really. One is just canopy closure, so where trees have been removed from woodlands, particularly with sort of plant health Burning, um, but the canopy closures occurred during that time from the trees that were there, but also with good management of the existing tree stock. So, by looking after the trees Torbay Council had, they improved their canopy by far more than they probably would have done by new tree planting. Um, so, it really does go to show the importance of managing the, the urban forest we have rather than just focusing on, on tree planting. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, 25. Thousand pounds added to the budget initially in 2011 and 14 in Torbay. Um, tree trails were, in, were created by the National Health Service, so um, again, hopefully improving public health there, people being able to go out and, and sort of enjoy their, their trees on, on tree walks. Um, it's informed the tree planting strategy, being able to look at the uh, species diversity, age structure, and, and those areas where trees are needed the most. Um, I don't think this is an interesting amount of work, but it's not, sorry, it's just <laughs> straight through. Um, and, and led to the rerunning of the project in 2021. Um, in Sidmouth, it's a small town in, in the southwest of England. Um, we carried out an iTree eco project, largely carried out by volunteers in, in the public. Um, that led to them holding an annual tree day, um, talks at their science fair. It really helped foster a better relationship between the tree officer and the people in the public who care about trees. I think previously, before the iTree Eco study was carried out, he was largely getting angry letters, emails from members of the public who possibly felt that he wasn't doing enough to maintain the urban forest. The iTree Eco project gave those people who were particularly passionate about green infrastructure and trees and tree officer a better opportunity to meet and talk. And they've now become involved in the trees in a, in a much better way. I believe the public now have actually become engaged in, um, well, we have a British standard for, for trees on development sites, so that, you know, whether development projects taking place, that members of the public are getting involved, ensuring the tree protection is in place, um, and, and it's yet really fostered some, some better, better relationships. Um, and, and one quite exciting thing that came out of that is the town is now an arboretum. So, members of the public, you know, they're, they're encouraged to plant 
a wide range of trees really creating that our recent deal. Um, some of the public who have got full land holdings are increasing that, planting new trees, monitoring how they're faring in the environment. It's a similar as a coastal area, um, it's quite exposed, but there have been a you know, um, yeah, number of uh, people discovering that some species that probably the council wouldn't have wanted to plant because we weren't sure about how well they survived. Um, it's really, really showing that the species range that can be grown and, and yeah. Creating an arboretum for the town is, is a lovely thing. Again, there are leaflets in the uh, doctor's surgeries and in the um, tourist information centre with tree trails so members of the public can go around and, and appreciate the, the arboretum town. Um, and again, there are the community tree strategy with the council, so that's really you know, furthering that, that arboretum. So people are planting a, a wide range of trees that you wouldn't normally expect to find in a sleepy coastal Devon town. Um, Islington, um, again this is overlaying tree canopy cover with, with socio-economic data, so looking at where trees can really be beneficial and benefit the public. Um, and again there seems to be every study I looked at there's a real correlation between tree canopy cover and those sort of areas very more, poor, uh, more poorly on, on socio-economic sort of factors. Um, they secured £120,000 of funding for new tree planting and maintenance. Um, we've gone on to plant, uh, to create a tree planting opportunity map, which again, as I said, we effectively look at canopy cover. We remove canopy cover from the map, so you're not going to plant any trees where there's already existing tree canopy cover. We then look at all the sort of socioeconomic data, um, and we've also then um, worked with the sort of highways and infrastructure teams so we can remove visibility displays at, at road junctions, sort of knowing there can't be any trees planted here because drivers have got to be able to see when they approach the junction, the minimum length, uh, width of the pavement that the authority would be happy planting trees in, so we can immediately exclude all of those areas beneath a certain width um, from their tree planting. Looking at areas where we can build out curves for incorporating trees and then, you yeah, know, identifying all those areas where tree planting is going to have the biggest benefits and also saving the tree officers a massive amount of time and having to go around and, and identify these areas themselves. Um, currently, unfortunately, we don't have data on underground services, so it's, you know, we, we, show we could, could potentially plant trees, but as I'm sure it's very similar in Europe, you may get to these areas and realise that there's gas mains, electric mains and water pipes in a lot of these areas, so um, I believe there is a move in the UK to have um, utilities on a GIS platform, um, but I guess the very nature of them being underground, there's, there's always going to be less accuracy than above ground features. Um, I know from my own experience in, in tree planting urban areas, you may you, you can get the service maps, but actually it turns out that the services are five metres away from where they thought they were on their map, so we'll always need that, that ground treatment um, to double check that. Um, who are using the results, and what will they be using them for, and why. Um, again, I mean, carrying out the iTree eco studies, they're very interesting for people working with tree managers, people working with green infrastructure, but a hugely important part of carrying out the study is really ensuring that that, that data is disseminated well um, and can actually affect change. Um, so identifying partners, scope and method for the study, the core objectives, delivery channels and key audiences, um, and then cost structure and funding resources. It's, if you're lucky enough to have a tree in the tree that can be fed straight into iTree with, you know, only about to find some of the data through Excel and that's, you know, all well and good. If you're looking at carrying out an iTree sample project or a full inventory, um, that's going to need people on the ground carrying out the tree surveys, which has you know, quite significant cost implications potentially. Um, so this is a DEFRA graphic here. Um, enable, engage, exemplify and encourage. So system, what type of infrastructure services, skills, guidance, information and or support is needed. Um, 
who are you targeting and how will you target. So generally when we start an eco project we'll meet with the team who've, who've uh, commissioned the study and then invite wider stakeholders, so local wildlife groups, um, interested members of the public, I don't know if you have sort of tree warden schemes or, or anything similar here in Europe. Some, some towns in the UK have tree warden schemes where they'll be engaged and want to be involved. And then it's also bringing in as many people as possible who are actually decision makers, policy holders, people from highways, from planning, to ensure that the findings from the eco study actually inform wider policies rather than just sitting with the, the tree managers themselves who I'm sure many of you have discovered you can stand there shouting about the benefits of trees, but not, not everyone in all the other departments across local governments or uh, regional areas will necessarily listen. Um, so I'm not sh sure how much time you spend, again, identifying partners, go better the objectives, to reach out on the key audience. Um, so, in the case of SIGMA, the core objectives were greater community involvement, local decisions around trees. They highlighted the SIGMA whole reason idea and informed future planning. Um, and the key, key audience is the local residents, the councils, and the tree officers. The tree officers, obviously, for, for understanding their tree stock, local residents for getting across the importance of trees to them, and then councillors, because they're the ones ultimately are going to make the decisions on funding, so it's important that the benefits of trees are really understood by them so they can see them as, a, as an asset rather than a, a risk. Um, so, after identifying core objectives and the key audience, then there's the delivery, shop, uh, delivery channels. So, in Simpson Park recently, you see on their website, new newspaper article, um, Tree Walk and Science Fair stand, um, it was a presentation by us to the councillors, and then the report and the more data provided to the tree officers. In the case of Sidmouth as well, um, it may not be something you, any of you have heard of here. In, it, in a few towns in England, we still have town, town criers, which are a you know, throwback to, to days gone by, so a man with a bell, ringing his bell, telling the the public about events of the, the time or day. So in Sidmouth they had the town prior going around ringing his bell, oh yay, oh yay, hear ye, Sidmouth trees produce X amount of uh, ecosystem services. So it was quite a, a nice and unusual uh, method for, for getting the findings out. Um, and your objectives, target, target audiences and anticipated delivery channels, who needs to be involved in the project? Um, so again, we've seen the key audience there, um, and just anticipated audience users or their representatives, and their media and comms teams, and other resource providers. Um, so here, the, the part that the with our recent once it was um, set up, the tree officers obviously included, um, and parish councillors. We were involved as an organisation, science fair organisers and local schools as well. Um, so now we're sort of slightly more into, <laughs> into the i stuff. So I'll skip through some of this, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, assessing the cost implications, and time, cost as well as days and funding opportunities. Um, so yeah, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if I should have left this in. <laughs> it's possibly um, teaching, teaching all stuff you already know. So the project planning and management, desktop survey preparation, training. Um, if you've got a team of professionals carrying out work, then training's you know, not so important. But you'll obviously always, always want to get them together to ensure that they're collecting um, consistent data. Um, if you're using volunteers, like we quite often do in a lot of our projects, obviously the training is, is a little bit more onerous and requires a bit more time and input. Um, so we normally train volunteers, give them sort of two days training on the data collection, um, and provide them with the equipment they need. One of those things always with the volunteers is going to be um, a good tree guide so they can identify the species, although we'll always have a lot of uh, you know, a lot of inquiries about trees and, and then the risk as well with that as we get 
a lot of generic species come back, so that the results may be not quite as accurate as, as when we're carrying out surveys with, with professional teams. Um, so this is just a, a you know a task list to set up an, an I tree eco project. Um, we'll initially start the set up meeting with the with the clients or, or you know um, town city council where we're, we're carrying out the project, dropping a time line budget, um, county survey report, and then press releases are something that we always try and include in our in our I tree eco projects again to make sure that the data is is got out there into the public domain and it's, and it's disseminated, otherwise there's, there's always that risk that the data just sits on the, the desks of uh, the tree officers and tree managers and, uh, and there's little value really in that. Um, and to set up the eco project, it says here 250, 200 randomised plots, but generally we'll try these 250 plots to give the better um, standard error, um, show you a graph at the moment. About the accuracy of that, creating maps for surveyors, survey forms, identifying private landowners and public landowners. Um, we'll then mail drop the, proper, the private landowners to know that surveyors will be coming onto their land and carrying out the surveys. Um, identifying volunteers and community engaged stakeholders, progress meetings with the clients. Um, Following up the landowners and they don't respond to initial letters. I think that this is actually an older project planner. Quite often now we'll just give our um, surveyors an ID badge and headed paper because I think quite often people will ignore letters from their local authorities. So we, we found you can send them letter after letter with, with no response whatsoever. So actually knocking on the door, if there's no one there leaving the letter at that point has, has worked better. And then after two visits, if there's no one there, then we'll send them to a, a backup plot in the same land use category in the same area to ensure sort of consistency of the, of the survey. Um, so to return all the data, um, we'll then create a report calculating the cabot values, as I said in the UK, that's the capital asset value of amenity trees um, to give another financial um, or quantify quantify the financial um, contribution trees are making final or third press release. It will create a technical report, a bespoke report, and a, and a final press release once the project is completed. Um, let's through that. Um, and again, experiences, some of these you'll have had yourself, experiences from around the world show that a well planned I tree survey will allow you to kick off a wide range of changes and actions. Um, the most effective tool to keep this event alive and sustain change over time is to develop and adopt a tree strategy or urban forest management plan. Um, in England, we're becoming, well, I, should, I would say Britain, but seemingly even as a country, England, we're becoming more and more isolated, even from our neighbouring states, thanks to uh, devolution and different parliaments being in charge of different areas of day to day sort of running of the countries. But in, in England, we um, had an English Trees Action Plan released a year ago and a part of that is for all local authorities in the country to have a tree strategy or, or management plan. Um, lots do, um, lots are very generic, but there's a surprising amount of authorities in the UK that still have no real sort of management plan beyond, and even in fact some that don't have proper tree risk management policies, but quite a lot of them don't go beyond those, those tree risk management. Um, policies. So carrying out an tree eco survey is a really good starting place to help authorities understand what they have before they start trying to plan a, a master plan or strategy as an obvious starting point. Um, so yeah, when we're collecting um, random samples, uh, This is for a plot sample. As I, as I said, an inventory sample in my tree eco, I'm sure any of you know, you feed all of the tree inventory in, and you can calculate the ecosystem services of, of all the trees. Um, across a city or a town, it's impossible, or likely to be impossible, to record every single tree. So we do a sample survey and then extrapolate up from there to give an overall picture of the urban forest as a whole. So the data collection, um, had 
with a random example, every tree or plot has the same chance of being selected as any other. Um, you can break the population into subgroups of better numbers, um, and the mind tricks evenly, so there's a need for a rigorous method. Uh, a rigorous method. Um, now, depending on what your area is like, and if you're doing an eye tree, you can study in a city area, then a random sample will be absolutely fine. You know, you'd like to find similar land uses, or it would be one land use across being urban across the whole area. If you're getting into areas with more rural areas, large amounts of water, um, forestry land, agricultural land, then a sort of random can cluster them together. A random grid is the methodology that we would ordinarily use, so you've got a grid over the area and then each plot is placed randomly within the grid and that prevents this grouping you can see here with a, with a truly random sample. Um, the issue with the random grid can be, as I was saying, if you've got an area, as you can see in this map, those red areas are, are densely urbanised areas, we've got a large area of water here and then agricultural land around the edge. Um, an eye tree eco project obviously is focusing primarily on urban trees, um, so you don't want to be skewing your results massively towards particularly big, large areas of water or, or agricultural land where there'll be no tree <coughs> that, you know, that data is not going to be very, very useful. So we'll stratify the samples by land use. So if 50% of the land is, is agricultural land, and we know that, then we'll intensify the number of sample plots within the urban areas where we're really looking to identify that tree stock. Um, um, so, variance, um, it's a measure of how much individual samples vary. The less the individual measurements vary from the mean average, the more reliable the mean um, in a forest, different traits to investigate may have different variances. Species distribution versus population size. Um, so this is what was sort of about number of plots, um, and I'm afraid I'm in no way a statis statistician any more than I am a public speaker. So forgive me. Um, my my ability to fully describe why this is uh, 250 plots is, is statistically sort of you know. Place where we draw the line, you can see the J curve there. The less plots, the greater the variation. Once we get to about 250 plots, we're down to about 10% or just below 10% of uh, standard error. And that curve really tails off there the more plots you do. So it's a, you, know, you, you, you come to a point where there's no point carrying out endless surveys because you've got a you know, good enough representative sample. Go into the full details of this. And again, the standard error there you can see quite clearly. So you have 10 plots, you're at less than 50% accuracy. Getting up to 250, you're down around 10% mark. Um, obviously, if you're doing a vast area, then that will need to be, will need to be asked. Um, Final sampling for sampling is our friend. Instructions to set up random plots on GIS iTree manual. Uh, validity of iTree depends critically on understanding the process and capability of the sample. Um, there are lots of videos, daily videos created on, on setting up iTree eco projects that they've got up above the resources and, and manuals online. Um, so, mapping here, we just have a look. This is again. Tor Bay, where we carried out a study in 2011 and again in 2021, um, also being in the area island. So we set up um, grids there and placed the plots at random within the grid um, to ensure that we've got a good sample across the whole of Tor Bay. Um, right, sorry, so here are the maps we create for surveyors. Um, we can actually use GIS. Um, to record the survey data as well, but if we're working with volunteers, we'll definitely produce paper map quite often. Volunteers that carry out the surveys tend to be pensioners, old age people who have enough time and, and availability to go out and do those surveys, so keeping it as uh, 
as easy as possible for them as far as technology is concerned is, is generally beneficial, so they'll get uh, Matt. Now with uh, what three words, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with that, I think that's a, a global system. So um, it will have a roadmap, identifying features, location, and then the plots there marked on a, on a map as well for them to, to get inside and carry out the surveys. And there's a example of that also about the, the carrying out the survey. Um, build work, so when we're heading outside, these are, you know, these are the, the criteria that they're filling out. So we'll record land use, be that commercial, um, residential, agricultural, parkland. Um, the ground cover, whether it's, and then it's very similar to what you've done with the machine learning, this is done, done, done out in the field. Um, so whether it's a building, cement, rock, soil, water, grass, um, mulch, or you know, bedding areas. Um, that then gives an idea of a potential plantable space. Um, you can record all the details of the shrubs as well. Generally speaking, we'll carry out just record trees, not the we'll, we'll record tree percentage cover, but often not tree spe uh, shrub species, if that requires another level of expertise, and particularly when you're carrying out surveys with volunteers, asking them to identify every single shrub they may have at risk in them significantly increase the, the time scale that's carried out for. Um, there's nothing about the tree there. Uh, but basically we're recording the percentage of the, of the plot that's covered by a tree, percentage of the plot that's covered by shrubs, and then notional, notional plantable space. Um, so here's the plot, 11.3 meters square. Um, and the plot center. Some representative tree polygons, and this plot is 25% tree cover. Uh, then we'll calculate the shrub cover in the plot, 21% um, shrub cover there. And the potential nation plantable space, we're removing the shrub and tree cover there, so you've got 50% potential plantable space in that plot. Um, is a representation of the different land, land uses that you've got commercial industry for transportation. Um, and then again, the ground cover, 10 centimetres, 85% maintained grass, and 5% duff, which is an Americanism. I'm not even too sure what that means myself, but mulch, I'm guessing that's just uh, planting beds. Shrub mass, I don't know if there's this much. Machine that's going into that. Um, but it's already these sort of idealized polygons for, for trees and shrubs. Um, so it's going to be recording trees. If, if you're doing a plot sample, every single plot will have trees starting at one. So you're going to carry down an inventory, you'll have your own tree and tree numbers, so they'll just run hopefully concurrently all the way up. But, um, Another thing we record in iTree is whether trees are ingrown or planted. So any tree that's been planted, recorded as planted. Anything that's seeded naturally would be would be called ingrown. Um, and obviously, in urban situation, very few of the trees are generally ingrown. Um, so I, yeah, I don't suppose I need to spend too long taking it with time on how we record the measurements. Um, this is largely for people carrying out surveys, just basically saying that all trees are different, so making sure that you have discussions and ensure that the consistency of data, the way you're recording diameters, etc., are a standard across the board. Um, and yeah, double measuring a, a diameter down at about knee height, so it's a, the best they can get there. And again, another example of the, you know, you bring the interior inspectors to be. Singing from the from the same hymn book. In this case, they have been recorded these individual trees, but you you know you want to make sure that those people who are getting out surveying are all doing the same thing, rather than one person recording down here on the trunk and another recording them as individual trees. Um, so yeah, they just sort of just really record the data in, in our tree. We'll have the tree 
treehouse and the live top and the tree hybrid. When there is a difference, you can see, you know, often you'll get a couple of dead branches sticking out the hot top. And this is really when it comes to calculating uh, leaf area index. Uh, height of the tree, the crown spread based on north to south and east to west measurements, um, and then the crown condition. Um, so, how complete is the crown? Crown dieback, crown missing, um, some very dodgy pictures of trees with different crowns on the couch, how much of the, the crown is missing. And even dodgy or you don't need a letter either. Um, so then you also calculate the crown light exposure. Um, again, this is another one that can vary quite a bit from inspector to inspector. You sort of idealise the crown as a five-sided cube or as a cube. So five sides could be exposed to like fucking one. And then depending on the proximity of other trees, you'll, you'll calculate how many sides of that tree is exposed to, to light between one and it's in a dense forest or none and it's in complete shade. Um, up to five for a completely open tree if there's no, no shade around it. Uh, yeah, this is just a few plots. Um, street tree or not street tree, this is a got a significant tree in, in Tor Bay. Uh, we would call that street tree, it's in a park. Um, and then somewhere around in London. Um, I'll tell you what uh, so using um, actually you can, the results we get, I don't know if you're familiar with the Trees Design Matching Group, it's uh, a group in the UK, um, does what it says on the tin really, it's, uh, it's uh, um, a group set up by, by tree care professionals to sort of try and improve tree care in, in the UK. Um, and I tree they can really help feed into a, a number of these issues that I don't find in trees in the, in the townscape are guide for decision makers, um, provides comprehensive understanding, um, which is you know your tree resource, um, and that's across the whole body rather than being just trees, street trees. Um, species diversity, so this is from the London I tree eco study. Um, you can map their species diversity across the different land use types, so residential is the greatest diversity. Um, they can lots going down and utility land being the most cemetery golf course in that land. So, um, size diversity is also a handy thing to have um, to provide people carrying out the I tree studies. You really want a kind of another kind of inverse J curve there, really to have a healthy tree population. Um, some towns have you know far too low of, of those larger trees, but having a, a greater number of trees in the smaller categories there really shows that you're going to have succession and trees that are able to be hopefully nurtured through to maturity. Um, ideal size distribution, which is the range of different tree sizes from, from different cities where my tree studies are being carried out but you can you know to always see this this J curve is quite a recurring theme. Um, and uh, yeah high number of, of juvenile trees that eventually become large trees as so many of them as sadly as they often do fail in the urban environment. Um, so again back to the tall base study there we about the species diversity, pie sharp of the, of the varying species. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to look at the, the most numerous trees and not necessarily the most important trees in an area that's really dictated by the leaf area index. So you can see that individually the most common tree in, in Tor Bay is Lake and Cypress, um, a lot of grown up hedging and hedging. Um, Ash is then the second most common tree, and sycamore the third. However, if sycamore is the most important tree in Tor Bay in terms of its leaf area index, um, and it also really highlights there, and I'm sure all of you in Europe are familiar with ash dieback, um, it helps to really understand the ecosystem services that are being lost through ash dieback across the town. Um, 
So here we are truly kind of very in depth and actually it's ashes is the uh, light particular section. Um, you know, the sort of just this like thing, this commentary comes out there and um, the oh, sorry, this is the important value, yeah, which is, is governed by the behavior index. Um, so again here we've been able to quantify the, the threats that Ash Diac will have on, on the um, ash population in across Tor Bay. Um, Quite 19 percent canopy canopy loss, which some of that has already been manifested in that 10 year gap that we had. Um, but as you can see, there's a 37 million pound replacement cost put on, on those ash trees across Torquay as a whole. Um, one of the useful functions of, of I tree is that you can carry out pest disease analysis. So if you've got something like ash, uh, <laughs> emerald ash borer, ash dye back, or you're kind of looking and seeing what the impacts of something like Zylella may be if it comes into the UK, then you can you can forecast that and see the percentage of trees you're likely to use. There's also the ecosystem services that will be lost and the replacement cost for those trees. Um, yeah, it feeds into having a comp comprehensive tree strategy. Um, having that starting point of your, of your tree species and uh, diversity in age range. Um, and it really fits into having a plan or strategic framework. So we've got kind of become a per hectare calculated across the full bay as a whole. Um, and again, that really enables that target plants in parking areas with low canopy cover, but also including in that, that social economic factors um, and we've really found actually the more we go into this opportunity mapping we found that you may have you know you're, you're drawing notional lines around an area to call it um, we call them uh, super output areas in the UK so areas of a population of about a thousand people you break down those broad areas but you could have a pocket of woodland which is inaccessible to everyone within a lower super output area which is skewing the canopy cover figures for that area. So you might say that this area's got 25% canopy cover, the area next door's got 5% canopy cover, but when you actually look at breaking down those boundaries and land, use, land uses and accessibility, the area that's got the 25% canopy cover could be on the same road as the area with 5% canopy cover, but because of that notional line, it looks the same. So we're actually quite often now removing canopy cover that's inaccessible from those um, outputs because we're looking at trees that are accessible to people for the, for the benefits and in terms of yeah, um, reducing the urban heat island, etc. If trees are, you know, the other side of a, of a busy motorway that's fenced off, although they'll be impacting the canopy cover figure for that area, they're not really having any impact on the, on the well-being of the people in that in that area. Park um, by trees, right species again. It's really. Understanding your tree population is the only way you can ensure that you're you're focusing your efforts on, on tree planting. Um, here we have a map on on uh, species diversity, um, and then unsurprisingly, the tropical wet forests are the highest, temperate and mountain forests are the lowest, and we can see here the London urban forest performs quite well. Um, London generally seems to have the greatest species diversity from anywhere that I've been in the UK in terms of trees, partly availability of, of nursery stock, you know, down to um, demand from people, but not from people, garden centres and nursery centres. So if you're outside of our city, you'll quite often find a lower diversity. There'll be fewer examples of, of unusual um, and exotic species that we get outside of species, outside cities. Um, Creating stakeholders again, that's you know another um, big advantage of the um, I three projects we've had is involving people from a range of, of government departments and also the public to ensure that they are aware of the benefits that trees produce and you know it's opened open purse strings quite frequently. Um, so how can it facilitate better management? Um, press release there, who's said money grows on trees. Um, that's the Torbay study. Uh, taking place 
on, or featuring on, on um, Evening News, um, so Milwaukee's I-Tree study there, um, showing the benefit of cooling. And we've also created um, a number of tree tags, um, also working with Pierce Flores um, in the Netherlands. So you can, cap you can calculate tree population ecosystem services, but you can also do that for individual trees as well. So we found that we can you know, calculate the stored, stored carbon, sort of sequestration, um, avoidance of and pollutant removal, and then put on trees. The tags, as you can see there, telling people what that contribution is, um, or tags for we did one for at the university where we were able to say what the ecosystem services were in a monetary term across the whole of the states. Um, again, this is a typical leafing tree survey. Um, that's management probe. Um, yeah, and I'm real bad that here. Environmentalists is talking about trees, decision makers talking about money, um, and we're able to look at the benefits in terms of the costs. Um, with iTree Design, we developed a tool with um, the Highways Authority in the UK. Um, I believe I should have a slide on in the moment. There you go. So, benefits provided by Woodland Departments next to highways in the or major highways in the UK um, the value of 15 pence per meter square per annum um, when that was averaged out across the entire soft estate so even areas without trees that was 8 pence per meter squared per year um, and the cost of maintaining those trees across the entire soft estate is 0.07 pence so you can really see the, the cost benefit analysis there um, and we were also able to calculate the, the benefits in terms of the costs when they're looking at fencing as opposed to new tree planting. Um, you can see actually the, the cost of the fencing is lower quickly, it accelerates beyond the trees, and then by year 100, the you know, necessity for replacing the trees and the benefit they provide is completely, you know, it's, it's vast in comparison to tree planting. Um, and this is a representation, this is Sydney, of, of the sort of carbon percentage of carbon stored compared to the carbon emissions of the town. Um, and again, some more billboards there from, from Milwaukee and uh, past disease analysis. One in five trees are at risk of the animal dash for it. may help us breathe easier. Uh, I think this is probably unnecessary. So hopefully that's. I bored you all enough on one morning. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Um, oh, we've got to have a lot of results, but again, yeah, just for really representations of land use, ground cover, and then comparison to some different um, studies. Uh, To London, you probably assume that London Plain was a significant tree, but that's just because of their, their prominence as street trees in, in you know, the most notable streets. As a as well, that's not actually true. Oh, I think we do now. In central London, I believe the importance of, of yes, I think they have 126 million pounds per year benefits provided by <coughs> trees across. Um, London, um, sequestration, 2.5 million tons of sequestered carbon a year, that's 147 million pounds. Um, yeah, hopefully that's... Thank you.